Happy midweek, everyone. Let's all sing praises to his name before we start our midweek worship. Let's all, let us all bow down our head and let's pray. Lord our God, as we give sing praises to your, may your holy angels join us and Holy Spirit dwell upon us. Amen. For our first song, let's all sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. Hymn number 323. 323. second song let's all sing all hail the power of jesus name hymn number 127 127 
For our opening song, let's all sing, I sing the mighty power of God, hymn number 51. Able, our Alpha and Omega, we are all coming unto thy your feet, O God. Lord, forgive us for every transgression against to your will and for every iniquities we do and for our all shortcoming. Lord, as we worship you on this Philippine International Church. We are all praying and blessed to those who are watching online for wherever they are, for whatever they are doing right now. May your Holy Spirit appoint to every people and to those listening right now and to dwell upon us and to, to magnify our faith and to focus and imitate your character. And Lord, as we continue to sing and hear your holy words, we are thanking you for who you are, for the God that we are serving is alive and sovereign for all over the world. And Lord Jesus, we are taking back all everything we have in our life, for every breath and strength that comes from you, for heavenly wisdom. And we are praying, open the heavenly gate to pour out your glory and touch our speaker tonight. For everything we're going to say will be only only come from you. Where all these things we ask in our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Finisher and the Creator. Amen. Dear members of the Philippine International Church and cherished online worshipers, a heartfelt welcome resonates from the depths of our shared faith. Whether gathered with these hallowed walls or joining us virtually from distant lands, your presence enriches our communal worship experience. As we unite in spirit, let us remember that our devotion knows no boundaries transcending physical distance to form a tapestry of love and fellowship. 
Together, let us embark on this sacred journey of worship, seeking solace, inspiration, and divine communion. May our collective prayers rise as an incense before the throne of grace, and may the melodies of our hymn echo with gratitude and praise. In this moment, let us cherish the bond that unite us, drawing strength from our shared faith and devotion to the divine. Welcome, dear friends, to this sacred space where all are embraced and none are strangers. Before I sit down, I would like to read this passage found in Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants and prophets. That is all, and happy midweek, everyone. Two. 
Brethren, good evening. Oh, um, am I the only one here at PIC right now? Good evening, brethren. Happy midweek. Amen. You know, it is a wonderful time to worship God once we are here gathered at His house of worship. And tonight, it is a wonderful night that we are going to tackle all about David's life. I know it has been the topic of our week of prayer, but this night is somewhat special because we would be studying David's life in a way on his kingship and how it all began. So let me ask the congregation this question. Have you ever thought to yourself, where is God? Is He really here? If so, why can't I feel His presence? We somehow think about these things the moment problem arises in our lives. But do not fret, because God is always with our side. Shall we pray? Our dear God, Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify your holy name in this evening. As we delve into studying your word, may you grant us knowledge and wisdom from heaven above that we will be able to understand the message that you want to convey to us, that it will be deeply rooted into our lives. I pray, Father, that tonight, May your name be glorified that the message shall resonate within our lives. And Father, I pray that your name must be lifted up, that you must increase and I must decrease. This is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, Based from the title, which is found in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verse 10, we can read over there. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you, my dear brethren, to kindly open it in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verse 10. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says here, So David went on and became great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. Based from this narrative, we can easily identify that the Lord God of hosts was always with David. So, let's ask this question, my dear friends. Who is David? Let's just say that right now, you are here with your friend, who is not an Adventist, let alone who is not a Christian. And then he would ask you, 
Brother, who is David? How would you introduce David to them? The Bible tells us in the next slide, David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 40 years in Hebron. He reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. So, the Bible tells us, based on the introduction found in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, that David was a king. But, there's still this question that your friend asks you. So, what if he's a king? Like, there's so many kings, not just in Israel. There's so many kings, not just in Judah. There are kings in different countries and places. So what makes David special? What's so special about him? And then let's see on the next slide. We can see here that it is about the book of Judges. You know, my dear friends, if you have your electronic Bibles with you, or if you have your physical Bible with you, let's go back to the table of contents of the Bible. Let's study the Old Testament and how the book were put into sequence. You know, reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, they are all interconnected. So, the book of Judges talks about Israel having judges as their leader. So, it started the moment Joshua, the leader of Israel after Moses, died. So, without a leader, there were chaos and there were distortion. Everyone would do what they find is good in their eyes. And so God appointed judges into different generations and in its tribe, 12 appointed judges, which became the rulers of the children of God, the Israelites. And so, you would ask me, so what, Brother Jovit? What about judges? Open the table of contents in the Bible. You see, right after the time of Joshua's death, the judges soon entered into the image. And after the last judge of Israel, the 12th judge named Samson died, it is when a new king had been born in which it had united the Israelites once again, a king ruled as their leader. So from judges to having kings as their leader, we can see there, it is Joshua, judges, first Samuel. But wait a minute, there's still book of Ruth. Why was it that in the time of judges, right after the last judge had died, why did it not immediately go into 1 Samuel? Why is there a book in the middle of it named Ruth? So in the next slide, we can see there, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. So you see, my brethren, even though God is a loving God, He does not let sin go unpunished. So when the Israelites had then worshipped Baal, God anger got aroused. And so, He let them get defeated by the enemy. They became servants of the enemy. But then soon after, the Israelites repented. And then they said, Lord, we are sorry for what we have done. Please save us. And so the Israelites 
were spared because God appointed judges. Next slide, please. And so, we can see here, my dear friends, the judges of Israel and the cycle of sin. So right after the Israelites had committed a sin against God by worshiping other gods, God punished them. And so, and after they had repented, God sent judges. And once the judges had died, it then again started from the beginning. The Israelites began to commit another sin. And so on and so forth until such time that peace and judges dies, the Israelites soon con soon made a transgression against God. So let's have a brief background first. Who are the 12 judges that were appointed to lead the tribes of Israel? So number one is Othniel. Number two is Ehud. Number three is Shamgar. Number four is Deborah. Number five is Gideon. Number six is Tola. Number seven is Jair. Number eight is Jephthah. Number nine is Ibzan. Number ten is Elon. Number eleven is Abdon. And number twelve, Samson. And the moment Samson had died, we can see there that in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so, the people committed many crimes because they think that is good. In my sight, it's okay to kill, to survive. In my sight, it's okay to steal so that I can bring back food to my family. But still, any form of sin, may it be the result is good, if you committed bad to gain good results, that is still a sin. And then, God wanted to unite them in having monarchy. The united monarchy soon started at the book of First Samuel. In First Samuel, we can read in this narrative the first appointed king of Israel, King Saul. But afterwards, this king had did, has always disobeyed God, which resulted in God appointing another king to rule the Israelites. But then again, here is the question. Why, instead of from the book of Judges, immediately transitioning to the book of Samuel so that the story would be connected, why is there a book of Ruth in between these two books from Judges to having kings? Let's have a brief background on what is Ruth all about. So you see, my dear friends, Ruth is all about a man named Elimech. Shall we read? If you have seen it on the screen, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It states here, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife, and his two sons. You know, the introduction of the book of Ruth started with a man named Elimelech. So, the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Both are Ephratites of Bethlehem. So why is it called Ephratites? Why, why not call them Bethlehemites? Because there's no such thing as Bethlehemites. Bethlehem 
is also called Ephrata. So those that are dwelling in Bethlehem are not called Bethlehemites. Instead, they are called Ephratites. And then, at verse, the following verse, it stated there in verse 3 of the book of Ruth. Shall we read if you have your Bibles with you? Then Elimelech, now Miss Husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And in verse 4, Now they took wives of the women of Moab, and the name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. And Orpha was the wife of Chilion, and Ruth was the wife of Malon. And afterwards, in verse 5, right after that they dwelt in Moab for 10 years, Malon and Chilion died. So, Naomi had a husband named Elimelech and his two sons, Malon and Chilion. Now, Elimelech dies and his two sons died, which leaves Naomi with his, her two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth. Now, the good thing about studying the Old Testament is you can have a good idea of its history. Now, in the following verses of the book of Ruth, with, after the introduction that Naomi and her two daughters-in-law were now the only ones surviving on their own, back then, if you are a widow, your father would be the one to keep you. So that's why in verse 8 of chapter 1, Naomi states there, go back to your mother's house. So it was stated that Naomi could not offer anything anymore. He doesn't have any job. He doesn't have any food to sustain both her two daughter-in-law. So they decided that Orpha and Ruth should go back to their parents. Because Naomi is already old, she doesn't have any parents. That's why when they arrived at Moab, Naomi wept, hugging her two daughter-in-law. And they said, now go on your way. Because I can't offer you anything anymore. Your parents can sustain you. I can't sustain you. And so Orpha went on her way, but Ruth clung onto Naomi. You know the good thing that we can see on the actions of Ruth? These are the type of people that is very much appreciated being our friends. Because once we don't have anything, we lost everything. Those who stay by your side are your true friends. And so, Naomi wanted both her two daughters-in-law to go back to their parents. Ruth stayed by your side. Because Ruth knows Naomi could not survive on her own. Naomi is already old enough. Who would take care of her? There were no orphanage back then. There were no homes for the elderly back then. So Naomi would just starve to death. That's why Ruth stayed by her side. Because she knows Naomi would not survive. And she would help her survive. But Naomi got mad. And she said, I will not talk to you ever again. So they went back to Judah, to Bethlehem. And then they arrived there. They were not talking to each other because Naomi was so mad. Why is Ruth staying with me? I can't offer her anything. But in the mind of Ruth, I will give everything I can give to Naomi. He, she would sacrifice herself just so they could eat something. And so, going back to the story, Naomi then suggested, you can go to the field of a rich person and you can glean there. You know the word glean, my dear friends? It means 
that whatever is left behind when a harvester harvested all the crops, the grains that they had, all that is left that is on the ground, they would not pick it up. They would give it to the poor, to the homeless, to the widows, so that they can have something to eat. And so that is what Ruth did. She went to the field, not knowing who owns the field. And then she gleaned the leftover of those who had harvested. And God is a loving God. Because by doing those gleaning, Naomi and Ruth were able to survive because God had provided for them. And so Naomi soon realized that the field that her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is gleaning over is from Boaz. Now, Boaz was a relative. And a relative is the one who can take care of those who are widowed. So back in ancient Israel, if then Orpha had already left and Chilion is, all, is still alive, when Malon died, Chilion would take Ruth as his wife. But because Malon and Chilion is already dead, no one can take Ruth as a wife, but the relative. So the relative is Boaz, and one which is unnamed based on the narrative of the book of Ruth is the much closer relative of their family. So Boaz was very intrigued to Ruth. You know the good thing that gives points to the person that you want to marry is when they see you doing hard work. Because when Boaz was walking past his field, he saw an unfamiliar face, a woman, a Moabitess. It was Ruth. And then he asked, what are you doing here? And then one of his servants said, ah, that is Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi. So Boaz knew within himself, this is my relative but I could not immediately take her as my wife. So he promises Ruth, I will talk to your closest relative. If he will not take you as his wife, I will take you as my wife. And so, the following day, Boaz arranged a meeting outside the gate. And then, he took ten men as a witness to their ritual. So he asked the closest relative, would you take Ruth as your wife? The closest relative took off his sandal. So Filipino parents would know, the moment you take your sandals off, you would spank your little children. But in Israelites' time, the history talks about this. When a person take off his sandal, it signifies, I am giving it to you. The responsibility is yours. So the closest relative, while talking to Boaz, took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz. I cannot take care of Ruth. You should do it. And so Boaz marries Ruth. You know, their story pretty much is a wonderful love story. But still, here's the question. Why is it in the middle of transitioning from judges to having judges in the tribes of Israel to having a united monarchy on electing a king in Israel? It's because once we read at the following verses in the book of Ruth, in here, we can see that when the woman, Ruth chapter 4, verse 14. So, verse 13, let's go back first to verse 13. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went in with her, the Lord gave her conception 
and she bore a son. So their love story ended that they got married and then they bore a son. But the next verses is very interesting. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. And in verse 16 of the book of Ruth, chapter 4, we can read there, Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom. Verse 16, And became a nurse to him. So Naomi took the child that were born to Boaz and Ruth. And in the next slide, we can see there, also the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they call his name Obed. He is the father of Jess, the father of David. And in verse 18, it talks about the genealogy of King David. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Am Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jess. And Jess begot David. So if you are still questioning, why is there a book of Ruth in the middle of not having judges anymore? Instead, immediately going to have a king, why is there a book in the middle? It's because it is an introduction on how God has arranged the marriage, the meeting of Boaz and Ruth so that King David would be born. So going back to the book of Samuel at the next slide. You know, this book is a very interesting book because this talks about how a king can become a good ruler over thousands of people. And we can see here that Saul disobeyed God by always following his own and did not trust the Lord. So whenever the Lord tells Saul, do this thing, and then Saul would look at it and doubt, like, will this be made possible? Saul would do it on his own and would not follow God's command. So God was not pleased with those type of people. So if you are always in doubt of God, it does not please God. So he anointed another king. And David became king of Israel. And on the next slide, this is one of the secrets of David in which we can better understand why is King David one of the greatest king of Israel? Because in this verse, we can read 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go attack these Philistines? It doesn't speak anything that much get attention. But if you look closely with how it started, David inquired of the Lord. Very much different on Saul. Because Saul would not inquire of the Lord. Saul would become selfish, self-centered. He would do it if he wanted to do it on his own. He will not follow anyone's command because he thinks his plan is much better than others. That's why God got displeased at him. But David pleased the Lord because he always asked the Lord before making decisions. That's why, friends, whenever 
there is something that you wanted to do. There is something that is very much keep on bugging your mind. Do what David did. He inquired of the Lord. That is one of the key traits on having a good and faithful servant. And the next slide, we can read there. Now therefore, thus say, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold and following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel, and I have been with you wherever you have gone. Take a moment to contemplate on how far you have gone from the point in which you have prayed for. You know, my dear friends, a friend of mine asked me, is this the right course for me? And then immediately in my mind, I said, why are you asking me? I even don't know the answer to that. Why are you sharing that to me? And then I just said, if you are in doubt about something, always remember, who is the one who took you this far? Is it your mother? Is it your sweetheart? Is it your friend? Or is it your own? I think not. You were able to get this far because God has been with you. And so whenever King David committed transgression, God would punish him. But still, afterward, after he had reprimanded David, he would remind David, I am the one who took you this far. He would remind Brother Jovit, Brother Jovit, it was not on your own that you are able to pass those exams. It was not on your own that you are able to become a second year student. It was not on your own that you are able to do your college here in AUP. It all was made possible because I was with you. The same way applies to each and every one of us, my dear friends. God has been the one directing our paths. And the next slide, we can see here the very last thing that David gave to Solomon. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. So from starting to having judges over Israel, when the people started doing any sorts of crime because they think it was good, then they were reminded by God, ops, 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 that's not good in my sight. I need to reprimand you. I need to discipline you. And so he disciplined the judges. The judges went into different forms of punishment from being servants to having famines. And then God soon rescued them from those punishments and then reminded them, I am still here. I just did discipline on you. And then the same way on Ruth, when Naomi lost both of his son and lost her husband, Naomi thought to herself, am I being punished by God? But then God directed Naomi's life into meeting Ruth. And Ruth stayed by Naomi's side until they talked to each other again, until they've been closed again, and then until they soon realize God is in control because Ruth soon met Boaz and Boaz married Ruth. 
So Naomi and Ruth were not suffering from hunger anymore because Naomi had now a son-in-law that is a rich person, Boaz. But the best thing is that Naomi became one on the genealogy of King David. And King David was the one in the lineage where Jesus was born. So let us remember, my dear friends, when David said to Solomon, do not be afraid nor discourage. Always remember, the Lord, my God, will be with you. So if ever someone approaches you, a friend of you is having a hard time, and then they approach you and ask, Brother Jovit, what shall I do? I'm having difficulty. Shall I still pursue this career? Or shall I stop going to school? Don't immediately say, Ah, kaya mo yan. Ako nga. Don't say those words that you will tell them, I've been there. I've experienced those things. Mas malala pa dyan. That's a no-no in comforting others. Instead, if you truly want to be a good friend, lead them back to the Lord. Lead them back to Jesus. Just tell them, pat them in their shoulders and say, you can do it. Makakaya mo yan. Dahil ang Panginoon, ang Panginoon ko ay kasama mo. David won many battles because God was with him. Ruth got redeemed because God was with him. And many more people experienced difficulties in their life, but they were able to overcome because God was with them. And in the last slide, my dear friends, this is the message I want to leave in your lives, in your hearts today. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. Always remember this verse. Whenever you feel so tired, whenever you feel so burdened that your heart is aching so much, you are crying every night, remember, the Lord God is always by your side. May the message of hope had reached our hearts and may God enrich our lives that we can share this good news that God will always be with us. Happy midweek and may God bless us all.
Let's check. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord of God, for that wonderful reminder that you are always with us. The same way that you have been in David's journey all throughout his life, 
It's the same way you will be with us, even in all anguish, in all trials, and even all the storms that comes into our lives. You will be there standing by our side. I pray, Father God, that the message have resonated into our hearts, which will be deeply rooted and will be reflected into our lives. And Father, I humbly pray that you will continue to bless these people that have heard your message and those people who have yet to hear your message. I also pray, Father, that if ever we have committed transgression in your sight, may you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we will be cleansed and will be purified once we are standing in front of your throne of grace. I pray, Father, that as we go home into our separate dorms and going back to outside our homes, I pray that you will dismiss us, that you will send your holy angels to guide, guard us, and that we will have a good rest in this night. I thank you, Father, for always giving us blessings. I thank you for Jesus, and I thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. This is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.